Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to the Small Business Center here at Coastal Carolina Community College. We've got a great program for you today in partnership with the North Carolina Military Business Center. At this time, I'm going to turn our program over to Ms. Paul Ann Page with the North Carolina Military Business Center. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. We appreciate y'all having interest in um, driving down here to spend some time with us. I'm Paul Ann Page with the North Carolina Military Business Paul Center. Can you hear Paul Ann? Can you hear? I'm sorry, my voice is a little scratchy today. Um, so we're, we want to get through a little housekeeping. Um, as you've come in, you know where the exits are if we have an emergency. So you'll exit either out to the right or to the left. If you need restrooms or water fountains, you know, back out to the left down the hall. You'll see the North Carolina Military Business Center office door. You'll turn to the left down that hall and the restrooms for both the men and the women are down there. Um, the water fountains are also located down there and there are concessions and uh, the vending machines if you would like. Um, also for all of those folks, how many folks are, is everyone here construction related? Okay, very good, all right. So, I mean, we may have some design folks. We may have our actual trades and industry, general contracting. So, especially if you're used to NAFAC work, you know that before you start any task on a construction project, what do you have to do? The activity hazard analysis and the safety, right? So, we've got a way, we know where we're, how to get out of the building, right? Um, we know where the bathrooms are, which are real important, so I did want to touch on a few of the other tasks and, and hazards that we may have. We may have paper cuts, so we want to be careful with the paper cuts and report all the injuries today. Um, we might have whiplash, you know, if you're nodding off, hopefully that won't occur, but it, with lots of people in here it's nice, warm, and so ugly, so we worry about some whiplash there. And then, of course, we don't want anybody dying from boredom, so we're going to try to um, make sure that we uh, answer your questions, give you the information that you need, and if we don't have it today, we're going to provide it to you later. So we're going to get started today. Um, this is our basic informational um, program for the Hurricane Florence recovery opportunities here in North Carolina, predominantly, as you're aware of, at Camp Lejeune, Cherry Point, New River Marine Corps Air Station. Uh, we do want to thank Coastal Carolina Community College as well as our small business um, center here. So we're going to talk about our purpose a little bit. We want to provide businesses with awareness of the Hurricane Florence recovery efforts at Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune, Cherry Point. Um, we're going to provide an overview of the planned execution of the construction. We'll try to give you some updates because you guys have been hearing this since August. Uh, most of you folks, we may have some folks that this is new to them. Uh, provide basic knowledge and um, provide some resources to help contractors find opportunities, especially if you're not already in the federal market. Um, some of the resources that may be helpful to help you be competitive and possibly win either as a prime contractor or subcontracting opportunities. Um, and even in execution of construction effort that's going to occur. Um, we're going to briefly go through the agenda today. So we'll have some brief introductions. Um, we'll talk about the NCMBC, who we are, what we do, and what we can do for you a little bit. Uh, we're going to touch on uh, construction programs and, of course, the hurricane recovery. Uh, we'll talk about some of the key agencies and their roles. We'll cover the seven uh, planned hurricane recovery packages and kind of give you an update of where they are in those uh, processes of release, um, especially for the folks that are here to team um, to help do some of this work. We're going to provide some tools for uh, business and industry. Um, how to identify opportunities, how to market your business, and how to qualify your business, um, either as a prime or as a subcontractor. We'll talk about some of the administrative and logistical requirements that we know are going to be, especially to lots of the new folks that may be turning to federal work, because we're going to need lots of folks to help get this complete in a timely fashion. All right, and some resources um, that you may need that you can reach out to as a business, large or small. Um, that 
here in the local area that can help provide you additional resources. So for our, um, the North Carolina Military Business Center, uh, I'm Paul Ann Page and I'm one of the construction specialists uh, here. That's my industry area of expertise. We also have Sue Cranes, if you'll raise your hand, right? So Sue is located in the Greensboro area. I'm located here in Jacksonville and Wilmington. Uh, and then we have Roxanne Reed and Roxanne is designated here as our business development specialist here at Coastal Carolina Community College. And our office again is, you can't miss us when you're on the way to the restroom. So feel free to stop by and see us, okay? We also have the executive director of the North Carolina Military Business Center with us, Scott Dorney, the face of NCNBC. And um, we wanted to again thank Coastal Carolina Community College, especially the Small Business Center. We work very closely with them. We actually have a little bit of a treat today. Um, we did not know that <laughs> Ann Shaw, of course, was going to be here. She is the Small Business Center <laughs> Director, but Ann is also the North Carolina Small Business Center director for the state of North Carolina. So we're very lucky to have her here in her office and her staff is here in this, in this building. Uh, and they provide a lot of great resources for entrepreneurs, for small businesses. They provide lots of training, free resources, um, and even low cost, very specific low cost technical training as well. So please, you know, feel free to, to reach out to them. You'll see some of their upcoming offerings posted out on the, in the lobby near the, um, the vending machines. So we'll ask you to take a look at that. And while you're in the area, whether you're, you work here daily or you're coming to the area to work, great resources right here for North Carolina businesses. Um, and then April Priester, April, if you'll, April takes care of all of us here <laughs> with the North Carolina Military Business Center and the Small Business Center here. And they do a great job for business in general, but we really appreciate all the support they give us. And then, way in the back, hiding out in the corner back there, we have from MCIEs, the Small Business Programs Director, Joe Rosie. My voice. And you'll get to hear from Joe in just a little bit. He says he's surprised, but every event we make him do something. Uh, Paul Ann, I think we also have from the city of Jacksonville, uh, Ron Massey. Ron, are you here? Oh. Great. There, there you are, Ron. Thank you so much, Ron. Any, anyone else of our local government agencies here? All right, great. All right, so I'm going to uh, reintroduce Scott Dorney, the executive director of the NCNBC, and he's going to tell you a little bit about our organization. Okay, if you stay there and flip slides, that'd be great. Good afternoon, everybody. Really appreciate everybody being here. Many of you we already know from other projects that we've done in the past and, and the Federal Construction Summit that we do every October in Wilmington. I've seen many of you there many years, and some of you could be up here teaching this class. So, uh, so thank you for being here. There's a uh, good reason to be here. I saw Joe Angel last night up in Raleigh, and I said, why are you coming to this training? There's always great networking opportunities, and uh, so please take advantage of that while you're here today. I know we have some potential primes, we have specialty contractors, we have suppliers as well. So the other thing I would say is you'll notice we're doing this over your lunchtime. We did tell you to feel free to bring a bag lunch. This is not like elementary school. What did the teacher always say? Did you bring enough for everybody in the class, right? No, if you have your lunch with you, feel free to eat it and, uh, and uh, enjoy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Military Business Center. We can't pass up an opportunity uh, to tell you who we are, what we do, and how you can utilize our services. So the Military Business Center is a business development and Technology Transition Agency of the North Carolina Community College System. Uh, we currently have 12 offices across the state of North Carolina, but that's gonna be changing. I'm happy to tell you that for several years we have asked the General Assembly to please consider expanding the Military Business Center so we can offer more intensive services to businesses across the state. For example, right now our farthest west office is in Charlotte. And if you've driven to the mountains, you know there's a lot of North Carolina on the other side of Charlotte, right? So the General Assembly this year included additional funding for the Military Business Center in the main budget, 
which unfortunately didn't make it through the whole process, but it was also included in the, uh, in the community college budget, which did pass. So thanks to uh, Senator Brown and the delegation here from Jacksonville area, and from really all across the state, we appreciate the support and we will be growing. So that's the good news. Uh, we are totally state funded. Uh, we are a statewide organization. We're the only statewide military business center in the country. Next. There we go. I think we missed one. Okay, so what's our mission is to leverage military and other federal business opportunities to help you grow your businesses, grow jobs, bring more revenues into the state of North Carolina, raise the tax base in the state. So at the end of the day, whether you live in Jacksonville or Fayetteville, or whether you live in Wilmington or Asheville or Murphy or anywhere in between, we provide better services to people across the state of North Carolina and improve quality of life across the state. We were given three goals by the General Assembly. I know it says four. We were given three by the General Assembly. Help existing businesses increase their federal revenues, i.e. win more contracts, so that you can grow jobs, uh, increase revenues, and, uh, and, and uh, raise the tax base. Secondly, to support the integration of military people into the workforce. Long before it was cool, Back in 2005, 6, and 7, we realized that our transitioning military folks, how many transition out every year in North Carolina? Joe Angel, I know you know the answer to this. About 18,000 people transition out of the military every year from our bases right here in North Carolina. That's a great engine to grow our existing businesses and attract new businesses. Support defense-related recruitment. So if we want to increase the size of the military economy in North Carolina, we got to do it two ways. We've got to help existing businesses win more contracts, and we have to bring more defense contractors to North Carolina. So that's part of our job. In uh, 2009, we went through a funding review. The General Assembly said, if we could do one more thing, what should we be doing in North Carolina that we're not currently doing? And we said, somebody has to do technology transition. So help small businesses, normally small businesses, that are developing new technologies to introduce those technologies that have defense applications to DOD. Well, 2009, did we get more funding? That was a bad time, right? So, uh, no, we didn't get more money, but in 2016, we did open a defense technology transition office to do that work. Uh, so, this process works. I said we're a business development organization. I'll show you what that means. Often, I go to the General Assembly and, uh, and I'm up there and I get the same question all the time. They don't ask me how many classes we taught or how many transitioning military people that we help find employment. They ask me one thing, how many contracts have you won? And I always say, none. We don't win contracts. We have the privilege of helping great businesses like yours provide some technical assistance you win these contracts. So we don't take credit for the 3,435 contracts. You won those, but we provided some assistance and that brought $13 billion worth of revenue into the state. Next. So I mentioned that we do business development. So that doesn't mean we're not interested in developing businesses, but there's great organizations, our Small Business Technology Development Center, the PTAC, the Small Business Centers, the community colleges, the universities. They're building the business capacity helping businesses like yours and others be capable of doing this federal work. That's not what we do. We focus on business development, identifying what are the contract opportunities, connecting those to businesses, helping businesses pre-position, team together to win future contracts. So that's what we focus on. And again, it's been a successful model to the tune of $13 billion. Next. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, where you see the dark stars is where we have offices across North Carolina, and thankfully, some of those white stars are going to be filled thanks to the General Assembly and the governor signing the uh, community college budget. So we'll be adding stars to these. The, bottom, the message here is that we're not just here in Jacksonville, and I know you're not all from here in Jacksonville, but a lot of you are. So we've got a great local team across the state. In addition to those stars, we have strategic industry professionals like Paul Ann and Sue that forgot more about government contracting than I'll ever know, okay? So uh, we're across the state to help you. Next slide. All right, uh, I think I'm turning it over to you, Paul Ann. And if I'm wrong about that, let me know. 
Okay, go ahead. All right, so the FY20 construction program and the Hurricane Florence recovery program in North Carolina. I see folks taking notes, that's great, okay? But I would tell you these slides are gonna be available and there's a lot of them, okay? So they'll be on the same website that you registered on the NCMBC website on the Hurricane Florence recovery page. So you, you don't have to copy all these down. Certainly feel free to take notes, but you'll have access to the slides. Next. Okay, something to understand, and, and NAVFAC, did anybody attend the NAVFAC Industry Day that was hosted in Charlotte back in August? So some of you did, that's great. And one thing that Camp Lejeune and Marine Corps installations stressed is that this $1.7 billion in Hurricane Florence recovery is a lot of work, but it's not the only game in town, okay? Uh, what is MILCON? So we'll talk a little bit about MILCON because uh, we're talking about new construction here. There is a specific definition. MILCON is new square footage over a million dollars. You'll also hear us talk about SRM or FSRM, Facility Sustainment Restoration and Modernization. That's any restoration or maintenance project or new construction that's less than a million dollars, okay? So that's to preface my comments later on when we say that there's, well, there's $1.2 billion in construction. There's some really big repair projects. And when we talk about the 1.7 billion new construction, there's a lot of SRM and, and FISRM work as well. Here in North Carolina, we're very fortunate to have always, every year, one of the largest military construction programs in the United States. For FY20 and, and the um, National Defense Authorization Act was just passed the other night, but we have uh, almost $500 million in major MILCON uh, being done in North Carolina in FY20. We're the third highest state for major MILCON projects, uh, $151 million in additional carryover projects from the prior fiscal year. So although we're here to talk about Hurricane Florence recovery, it's not the only game in town. We've got a lot of MILCON going on across the state. In addition, watch for uh, about a billion dollars of military construction work to be done at Cherry Point over the next decade to get ready for the F-35 strike fighter, which will be fielded in uh, about the middle of the next decade. Okay? Actually, in the next four years, they're planning to spend um, $200 million on 75 projects. So it's coming quick. It's coming very quick, okay? The last point there, we're talking about specific projects today not only the Hurricane Florence, but you'll see some other MILCON projects. Be aware that there are a lot of multiple award construction contracts, a lot of multiple award task order contracts, a lot of, I know we got a lot of acronyms, that's just the world we live in. The uh, uh, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts that are gonna be bid in FY20. What does that mean? Those are the gifts that keep on giving, okay? So if you see a project advertised as a MAC or a MATOC, you should definitely consider competing for that because it'll put you on a short list of contractors for future MILCON work. Next. All right, we do have a major MILCON program across the state. I just threw these up to give you some idea of what's going on in addition to the Hurricane Florence work. We have a lot of work at Fort Bragg with the Special Operations Command, and I won't talk about each one of these specific projects. SOCOM has projects at Camp Lejeune uh, as well the Navy at Camp Lejeune, and you'll see when we talk about these different agencies, who does what. Projects ranging from 10, 11 million dollars to the big project at Camp Lejeune, the 2MEF Operations Center replacement project, 122 million dollars. So in it, that has nothing to do with the Hurricane Florence. This is in addition to the Hurricane Florence work. Next. So, uh, the bottom line on this slide is pretty simple. There's a lot of people who do construction at bases in North Carolina. Here, if you're, if you're used to being in the Camp Lejeune, Jacksonville area, you'll hear about Marine Corps Installations East and Camp Lejeune and New River. But there's a lot of agencies that own facilities that acquire construction work and that execute construction work in North Carolina. Uh, of course, Marine Corps Installations East, Camp Lejeune, New River, uh, projects here, they're the owner. You would think if you do civilian construction, that's who owns those facilities. They utilize NAVFAC Midland, the Naval Facilities Acquisition, Naval Facilities Acquisition uh, Command, 
uh, boy, I'm so used to using acronyms, I forget what they even stand for. So NAVFAC Midland in Norfolk uh, acquires that work and executes that work on Camp Lejeune themselves and through the office uh, um, in charge, officer in charge of construction and the resident officer in charge of construction. So they're all executing that work on Camp Lejeune and New River. Uh, at Cherry Point, again, they utilize NAVFAC Midland and the Facilities Engineering and Acquisition Division on Cherry Point to execute that work on the base. You can see at Seymour Johnson, they used the Corps of Engineers Savannah District, Fort Bragg, the Wilmington District for the SOCOM Special Operations work, uh, and the uh, Savannah District for their other work. The um, Military Ocean Terminal at Sunny Point has a lot of construction projects that are require, acquired by the Corps of Engineers Wilmington District. And then, of course, we have the Coast Guard uh, with a major base at Elizabeth City and their Shore Infrastructure Logistics Center in Norfolk acquires all that work. So why do we tell you that? Because you need to be monitoring opportunities, not just from Camp Lejeune, uh, but from NAVFAC, from the uh, Corps of Engineers, from Wilmington, from Savannah. There's a lot of people that acquire that work here in North Carolina. Next. Again, more projects, uh, both at Cherry Point and at New River. Uh, these are non-hurricane related major construction projects. Next. All right, so what do these uh, agencies do? You're going to touch on this, Paul Ann? You got it. Okay, um, actually, we'll get down to the role of the key agencies um, and the contractors who you should be aware of and in contact with, um, who are the owners, who buys the work, who executes the work, who oversees it, and who pays for it. And that doesn't seem like in a simple sentence that that's very important, but um, there's good reasons that you should know how that work flows through when you're a contractor. So um, I'm going to have Joe come up and talk while we're here at the Marine Corps Installations East, um, our small business programs director, Joe Rosier. But there's no running. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joe Rozier, and as introduced, I'm the director of the Office of Small Business Programs for Marine Corps Installations East. And something critical that, that Scott Dorney touched on is the difference between the owner and the executing agency. How many of you have done business already with the federal government or with, with the base? And the rest of you, I would assume, have not. How many of you have found it frustrating? So, yeah. One of the areas, is, as I talk to vendors and as they make appointments and come see me, that they express their frustration is trying to figure out who do I talk to, who's, who's the decision maker, who can I get in front of to, to pitch my, my capabilities, my services. And so one of the things, just to, to stir that up before I hand it back and you continue on in the program, is understand that difference between who owns the requirement and who's executing uh, the requirement to, to, to be fixed or to be built. Within the federal government, those roles are, are vastly separated and there's a firm line between them. Whereas in the commercial world, they're often more closely intertwined. So if you own a building, then I, I'm trying to sell to you to, to, to try to meet your needs, meet your services. Although I'm on the Marine Corps side, I may own the facility. The U.S. Navy is the one doing the executing as far as fixing it, repairing it, building it, and you're actually trying to sell your goods and services to the Navy on my behalf. And so the, the Navy becomes your immediate customer, although long term I'm reaping the benefit. So bear that in mind. That separation of roles or function is key, and not just in the construction realm, but in general in doing business with the federal government. Understand that difference in functions. And so you've listed there Marine Corps Installations East. We are a, a regional headquarters overseeing roughly five, six installations up and down the eastern seaboard from Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point, Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune, which is the 800-pound gorilla within installation, Marine Corps Air Station New River just down the road, Marine Corps Air Station Beaufort in South Carolina, Marine Corps Logistics Command Albany in Albany, Georgia, and also Marine Corps Support Facility Blunt Island in the other Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Florida. 
All those installations are falling within the umbrella of Marine Corps Installation Z, as well as most of the tenant commands that are within them. Not all, there's some, some critical exceptions, but most of the tenant commands that are aboard those base, when they're at home, they're in garrison, say 2nd Marine Division, um, 2 MAF, 2nd MA, the Marine Aircraft Wing up at Cherry Point. When those Marines are at home in garrison, I'm their buyer. We buy their goods and services. When they go down range, they deploy with, with buyers, uniform buyers that go with them. But when they're at home, we're their buyer. But in terms of construction, although again, they're, we're the owners of the building. My boss, Major General Alford, owns those buildings. He told the Navy, I need you to repair those buildings. And it's the Navy that's going out. And say so your cr critical point of contact is Naval Facilities Engineering Command, NAFAC. They're a small business office if you're a small business, but they're the first person that you're going to interact with. They're going to solicit the contract. They're going to ultimately award the contract, and that's who you'll be doing business with on our behalf. And then hopefully we will see many of you on board our installations. Yes, I'll give you his cell phone number and uh, <laughs> where his office is located and his home number as well. Um, so Joe touched on NCI East big umbrella we're in particular talking about marine corps base camp lejeune cherry point and new river um, there are some projects that are coming out that are handled through NAFAC at um, beaufort at paris island marine corps air station beaufort and paris island as well as blunt island which is in jacksonville florida um, sometimes NAFAC southeast supports in those efforts too. So NAFAC Midland covers big core items, but sometimes NAFAC Southeast comes in and helps support too. So other opportunities to look for. We're also gonna talk just a little bit about uh, NAFAC Midland and how they've designed themselves as far as executing the work. We're gonna to touch on the global contingency contractors and their involvement in the current work and future work that is to, to continue. Um, we'll identify um, the current MAC holders, those that are active currently. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about, because a lot of folks here are, well, I'm a GC. If I'm not bidding on, if I'm not included in this, what does this matter to me? We'll talk about some other opportunities for you as well. All right, so the how of the hurricane recovery, um, the largest component of hurricane uh, recovery is going to be managed under the seven hurricane recovery packages and Scott's going to brief that and we'll give you an update of where they are in those progress. Um, and also the multiple award construction contracts, the ones that are in place and the one that we call the Big Mac um, that was solicited and is under evaluation at this point in time and that we're hoping to see um, probably at the first of the year to be awarded. All right, so the global contingency contractors and involvement in work programs, these are those contractors and a valid point of contract. And if there's some of these folks, I believe, that are up here on this screen or in this room, so um, I might can point those folks out to you. The global contingency MAC contractors, ECC won the initial um, contract to come in immediately after for Hurricane stabilization in the beginning of the recovery efforts. And then as it's progressed, they are releasing task orders um, now to the global contingency MAC holders, which are large groups of uh, facilities or work that they are currently bidding on as well. So we want to make sure that you had that information. This is also available on our website. Um, the current construction MAC holders that are the mainstay um, that are managed under NAFAC Midland um, are the general construction MAC and the, this one was extended and will expire this next year and they will soon be seeing a new GC MAC which will be for five years so you general contractors that are here uh, you'll want to be watching out for that one. The mini construction MAC um, that one is expiring in January. We have not heard the final determination if they're going to reissue another mini MAC. Um, the Hub Zone Construction MAC it is currently to expire this year. They did some extensions and allocated additional funds so that they could continue to issue some of this hurricane recovery and repair work on these MACs as well. Um, 
we have a new Mac that was just awarded back in September, so it'll be for five years, and it's a maintenance and repair Mac. And of course, we have the roofing Mac, which has been very crucial on the, the front side of the efforts. And some of these contractors even support the global contingency Mac. I tell people, Government contracting can be a strange bag. One day you're competing with someone and the next day you're teaming with them. One day you might be the prime, the next day you might be the sub supporting another federal contractor. So it's, it's a unique situation. We want you to be aware of that. On the North Carolina Military Business Link, um, it takes you to the construction link that has, whoops, the listing of the contract holders, that's just a glance. We'll show you how to get there as we go through resources a little later on. We are revamping and cleaning up our page so it's a little easier. It'll look more kind of like the Global Contingency Mac list. But that will be available um, on our website and we'll show you where that is. So as we go down, we want to talk about the anticipated hurricane recovery package. It's going to be, they're going to be awarded as seven single primes. That's the that's the acquisition plan at this time. Um, large projects, it's a two-phase um, process, and the, uh, the awarded phase two contractors will be recruiting for subcontractor support, specialty subcontracting trades, and we've even talked to a lot of the teams that are pursuing in phase one um, that some of their strategy is to team with other general contractors. When you see how large some of these packages are, you know, whole facilities, seven whole facilities in a package, it's going to take a lot of resources. So we even have um, the phase one contracting teams that are discussing about pulling in other general contractors to help support their schedule and execution of work that they would win. Um, so I'm going to get Scott to come back over. We're going to talk about those seven hurricane recovery uh, packages. We'll talk about the scope and the timelines. And again, it's a good time to give you some updates of where they are in process. All right. OK. Is everybody confused yet? OK. So the bottom line was we talked about $3 billion in hurricane damage. About $1.2 billion is repair. Okay, newer buildings did fairly well in the hurricane. 1940s era buildings didn't do so well in the hurricane. Okay, so we're going to repair the newer ones, 1.2 billion dollars. Replace the older ones, 1.7 billion. So how are they going to use that? And you'll see more on these slides. But the repair work, the initial repair response work, was done by the Global Contingency Contractor (ECC), who needs subcontractors, needed subcontractors, still needs subcontractors. The repair work, the $1.2 billion, which wasn't addressed in the initial recovery, will be done by either global contingency contractors or more than likely the MAC contractors, those companies that are on those multiple award construction <coughs> contracts that Paul Ann talked about. Then there's the whole $1.7 billion in the seven packages that you've heard so much about. So we'll talk about the scope and the timeline, the strategy, uh, the summary of each one of the programs, the acquisition strategy, the program schedule, and a little bit about the, the packages themselves, okay? So, uh, you all are either from here or very familiar with here, so you don't need a lot of uh, coaching about where Camp Lejeune is and where Cherry Point is, but certainly take a look at the scope of what we're talking about. Camp Lejeune has over 3,000 facilities and Cherry Point over 1,400 facility. So there's a lot of facilities and a lot of potential damage on the bases. Next. Okay, so we talked about the, the status of the facilities. Camp Lejeune, over 3,100 facilities, of which 565 of those facilities sustained significant damage during Hurricane Florence. Uh, Camp, or Cherry Point, 1,400 facilities. Of that, 244 facilities were significantly damaged in the hurricane, okay? In addition to buildings, you had other critical infrastructure, railroad trestles, roads, bridges, and you'll see that as well. <clears throat> Go ahead, next slide. Okay, so a two-pronged approach to hurricane recovery, and that's what I've just talked about. So the facility sustainment, restoration, modernization, the FISRAM work to address the $1.2 billion in damage, 
and then the military construction and demolition of unrepairable buildings, $1.7 billion. So the $1.2 billion, some of it was acquired in FY19 and early FY20. The MILCON work, the $1.7 billion, will all be acquired during FY20, which ends when? September 30th of, of 2020. So there's a lot of uh, work to be uh, announced and awarded by the end of September. Okay, next slide. So I mentioned this. You had the initial response by the uh, global contingency contractor, ECC, who was actually at Camp Lejeune the day before the hurricane and ready to do immediate uh, repair work response to hurricane damage. The repair work, again, by the global contingency, the MAC contractors, and the replacement work that we're going to talk about, which is MILCON, military construction. Okay, next. Okay, so overview of that military construction, we're talking about 31 different MILCON projects. 30 are funded by the Marine Corps, one by Special Operations Command. The strategy to acquire this work is going to be design-build, okay? So almost all of this work is going to be uh, uh, design-build acquisition. Why is that? Because it's faster, okay? We've already been two years since the hurricane. Got to get these facilities built. The money is available during FY20, so design-build gives the most expeditious way for the government to acquire and get this work executed. The work, those 31 projects are organized into seven packages based on where the, the work needs to be done and the type of work to be done. So as you can see, the goal is that all of these seven design-build projects, one design-build contract for each one of the seven packages will be awarded during FY20. Next. So uh, that sounds pretty aggressive. So NAVFAC in their acquisition strategy has said, we're gonna, we're gonna have to do things a little differently even though we uh, use design build, even this is gonna have to be faster than our normal design build process. So NAVFAC will use a best value source selection process as opposed to low bid. So it's going to be the, the bidder that offers the best value to the government. Non-price factors are going to be more important than price, okay? Now that's not to say we got all the money in the world, we don't care what, what the cost is, okay? But the non, because they're going to acquire this quickly, things like the company's experience and their past performance on previous projects of similar size and scope is going to be more important than the actual price of the project. During phase one, proposals are evaluated based on the general technical approach that will be used, the corporate experience and the past performance, okay? NAVFAC will down-select businesses from the phase one proposals to move on to phase two, and during phase two, the, the three proposals will be evaluated principally on their technical solution, the schedule, and their small business participation, and price, okay? It's not saying that price isn't a factor, but it will be considered in phase two, okay? Next. So NAVFAC put out, and this is kind of hard to see, but it's a great slide with lots of color on it, so we have to include it, okay? A very aggressive schedule. This was what they presented in August, and Sue and Paul Ann can update it as needed, uh, but packages one, two, and four came out in October, and actual phase one proposals were due November the 8th, if I remember right. December, yeah. Early. Okay. Packages three, five, six, and seven were expected to come out in November, and we're a little bit behind on, on some of that. Some of them are actually due yesterday, I think. So we'll talk about that as we talk about the packages. Next slide. Is everybody impressed with that slide? Lots of color, okay. The key thing is that between February uh, and April is probably when we're going to see the down select to phase two. Could be as early as January, it's not going to happen in December, and all contracts will be awarded between July and September for all seven packages. Next. Okay, what, uh, what are these packages? So it's really hard to read, uh, but I would encourage you when you get to slides, take a look at them so you know the scope of the project. Package number one, so there's seven packages which are multiple project packages. Projects are packaged together based on their location and the type of facilities. So package number one is at Cherry Point. 
Uh, that consists of five different uh, projects, including seven different buildings to be reconstructed. A headquarters building, a security building, a maintenance facility, two fire stations, one academic facility, and a range operations facility, which actually is not at Cherry Point. It's on the coast and accessible only by boat at, uh, at bombing target 11, a range operations center. So the scope of that project is 175 to 225 million dollars, okay? So as you can see, there's uh, five projects and uh, seven different buildings there as the Milcon program at Cherry Point. So that's it for Cherry Point. Packages two through seven are all at Camp Lejeune, okay? Next slide. So uh, this is an overview of Camp Lejeune, and you can see where the different packages are. Packages two, three, and five in this area, the installation. Package, uh, well, it doesn't show all. Package seven is at New River. Package six uh, with uh, Marine Special Operations Command. And the bridge package is package four, which we'll talk about. Next slide. All right, so package number two is headquarters facilities at Camp Lejeune. There are seven different projects in package number two, and package number two includes 14 different headquarters facilities all at Camp Lejeune. The estimate, the government estimate on this project is 175 to 225 million dollars. So again, seven projects, but 14 different buildings, head, mostly of a headquarters. What's a headquarters facility? Uh, it's a commercial business office. Think about a brigade headquarters, a regimental headquarters, a battalion headquarters. They've got armories, they've got all the kinds of things that headquarters and office space. So think about commercial office space. That's pretty much what we're looking at here. 14 different headquarters facilities all located on Camp Lejeune proper. That's package number two. Next. Package number three is training and storage facilities at uh, Camp Lejeune. So this consists of three different projects and five buildings. One renovation and three new training facilities and a new warehouse at Camp Lejeune. The scope of this work is between 275 and 325 million dollars. Okay? So this project, three different uh, packages or three different projects, five buildings included in package number three all located on uh, Camp Lejeune proper. Next. Back one. Okay, so uh, that's really great for the vertical guys and gals in the room. What about us uh, horizontal contractors? You are not left out. Package number four is two bridge projects at Camp Lejeune, including the movable bridge over the intercoastal waterway and a railroad trestle over the White Oak River, and you can see where those are. The uh, estimate on that project is 125 to 175 million dollars. That seems low to, hey look, anytime you talk almost 200 million dollars, we're talking serious cash, but that actually seems a little low to me. But uh, two railroad, or two projects, horizontal projects, the Onslow Beach Bridge replacement and the railroad trestle over the White Oak River, and all the approaches that go along with that. Okay, next. Project number five, oh, we missed five, there we go. Project number five uh, is uh, support and allied instruction facilities, again, at Camp Lejeune. So this uh, package five includes seven support and allied instruction projects, including nine different buildings at Camp Lejeune. Two fire stations, three headquarters buildings, a mess hall with a parking garage and two academic facilities. The estimate on this project is 275 to 325 million dollars. Again, on main post Camp Lejeune, mostly support type fire stations and instructional facilities on the base. Okay? Next, next slide. So package six is at Stone Bay. Um, and package six consists of three projects two headquarters buildings and two academic, uh, I'm sorry, two headquarters buildings and one academic facility. The estimate here is 50 to 100 million dollars. Uh, again, that's at Stone Bay with uh, Marsat. Okay. 
Uh, package number seven is at New River. This is the only package at Marine Corps Air Station New River. It consists of four projects at New River. It's a barracks building, an academic building, a CH-53 helicopter and C-12 hangar, each with associated facilities. And that might not sound like a lot of projects, but it's worth 425 to 475 million dollars, okay? Any questions about the projects? I know it's a lot of information, but you'll have the slides. Yes, sir. Yeah, do any of the projects have solicitation numbers assigned? Yes, uh, we'll talk about that in just a second, but that's a good point. Yes, uh, all but two. We still haven't had two, two of the projects come out, okay? Yes, sir. No, a great question. His question was, is the global, are the global contingency contractors the only one that can bid on this? Absolutely not, okay? Uh, the global contingency contractors, they're on a multiple award construction contract, the global contingency contract. They were uh, identified to do the initial response work, and that's ECC. These seven packages are open to any company to bid on these seven packages, okay? Or all right. Teams. Or teams. All right. So let me, uh, that's a great point Paul Ann just brought up. You can say, man, I haven't done a $475 million project lately. Most of us haven't, okay? Uh, some of these projects are so large, and remember, there's going to be one contract awarded for each package. So some of these packages had seven projects, 14 buildings, I think one of them had. So one general contractor more than likely or a large design firm could be awarded that contract. So if you're a general contractor, and I think Pauline's going to touch on the role of GCs, you know, I don't want to steal her thunder, you're not cut out of this, okay? Because if I'm, a, if I'm the awarded the, uh, the prime contract for this and I've got 14 buildings to build, I'm looking for general contractors as well as specialty contractors, okay? Let me, can I, may I add something to that? Grab, grab the microphone. brought that up is because I don't want all, any of the small businesses to feel like they don't have a stab at this, okay? If you're a large business, just like ECC, it's by law that they have to have a subcontracting plan. That subcontracting plan is going to carry a lot of weight in the down selection of those con prime contractors. So for example, for ease of speaking, if you have a $10 million contract, $1 million is going to be subcontracted out. This is just ease of speaking. I'm going to say 60% of that $1 million is going to be subcontracted out. 10% may go to large businesses. What does that leave for all the other small businesses? 50%. So 3% could go to women-owned. 10% could go to hub zone, service disabled, veteran-owned small business. They have to meet that requirement. Okay? And it's going to play a heavy part in the down select. That's all. Yeah, yeah that's her, her last point. Okay, remember one of the criteria for phase two, in addition to price and technical proposal, was small business utilization plan. So that's going to factor in because you'll see when we're going to do teaming events, it's going to be between the point where the down select is made and the point where those down selected companies need to submit their phase two proposal and identify their subcontracting utilization, which is you, okay? Let me add to one more thing. When we hold those, and we will be holding these teaming sessions after the down selects are made, please bring business cards and your capability statements. Too many people walk in with just business cards and when you hand somebody a business card, it doesn't say, who you are, what you do, how you, what your past performance is. This will get you in the door with them faster, okay? Okay, we'll, we'll touch on that in a bit. Next slide. Okay. Okay, back to me. I'm not near as entertaining as Scott is today. I apologize, I'm a little under the weather. Um, so we're gonna, we have a few more items to touch on. Um, tools to identify opportunities how to market and qualify your business. Sue touched on a little bit of that now, how important that is. So especially for you folks, folks that are doing federal contracting, especially our large business components, 
They know how to do that. They have resources. They, they have their marketing folks. But for specialty sub-trades, sometimes they don't think that they need to market themselves or how to market themselves or even small GCs. So we're going to provide some additional support and training for those opportunities too later on prior to our teaming event. So if you're a small business and you don't have a capability statement or you didn't understand some of the things that Sue was talking about, we're going to offer some training sessions to help get you ready for that. And we're also going to talk about administrative and logistical requirements. A lot of our contractors that are in here, lots of familiar faces doing work on the base. Um, they know a lot of the requirements, but they're recruiting folks, and we're going to have to have a lot of folks do this work. So we're going to touch on some of those requirements that you might not know and need to be thinking about. And we're going to cover the resources to assist the businesses. All right. So um, one of the things that we want to do is, and when we actually put our slides on the um, website, we'll have, we're going to try to hopefully have the interactive links that are available, and there are going to be some handouts, or we're going to direct you to where other documents are located on our web page, so that you can download those things. So in our slides, we may have bullet points, but when I post it, I'll say handout, and we'll give you a direction to where that handout is located, or a link for a page. So the North Carolina Military Business Center at www.ncnbc.us. We have a hurricane recovery page that is very specific to that. So if you can find your way to our website, you can, it'll pop up right on the um, home page. You can hit that link and lots of information as well as we have even have companies that are bidding work or have been awarded work that are soliciting on that page. So those resources are there as well. Um, any of the contractors here that are actively doing that are GCs and you want to um, participate for federal work, we, we will help you solicit work that way on our webpage for federal work. Um, the other way of trying to find your way around of where the patch packages are, on our hurricane recovery page, we have each package listed, and I'll show you what that page looks like shortly. Um, you can hit that link and it will take you directly to the solicitation if it's been posted. If it's not, it'll say, you know, awaiting to be um, solicited. But the links will now take you to beta.sam. So those of you that aren't aware that FBO, Federal Biz Ops, no longer exists. As of November 12th, they have transitioned to uh, beta.sam. And I asked Scott during that time, um, we had this piece of the presentation, would it be appropriate if I cussed and did hand gestures? Because we are struggling. Um, all of you can attest to that. We're working through um, some of our own loops. We continuously give feedback. We've seen them responsive as they continue to make some corrective actions or the features to become better or more user friendly on beta. Dot Sam. But remember, always go back to our hurricane recovery page, and once that solicitation is posted, you can always hit that link. Um, but for beta.sam, if you were an FBO user, your account or anything you were following or saved or tracked no longer exists for you. You have to renew and establish an account um, as an account user in beta.sam, and once you do that, it'll allow you to follow those opportunities that you're interested in um, participating with. If you do not have, public can go in, you don't have to have an account to use the site, but if you want to follow a solicitation, you have to have an account. If you want to be an interested vendor, you have to have an account set up in beta.sam. It's free, it takes about 15 minutes and three cuss words, I promise. Um, <laughs> Just, just three. Your choice. Your choice. Um, I've decided I've developed uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and Tourette syndrome in the last six weeks. Um, and I'm hoping to see that become a little e easier to manage. The one thing that I will tell you for those that already have your account or as you're going forward. In FBO, when you had your account and you would follow or you would sign on for an interested vendor, any updates that would occur would come directly to your email. 
when you would click on interested vendor, it would put your name, your email address, and some information about your company by their NAICS codes of what they do. That interested vendor list does a lot of things. It tells companies that are looking to be prime contractors, they go to those lists to recruit subcontractors that may be interested. As a subcontractor, you may want to go and see who is listed as a prime contractor so that you have their, mar their information to reach out to them. The interesting thing that has happened at beta.sam is the account that you establish is under your company's name and your company's cage code. So to have an account in beta.sam, your company has to be registered in sam.gov. So when you hit interested vendor, it pulls your cage code information and if you're not the president, owner, or government point of contact, you're not the one that's going to be getting the email. Um, I was laughing at Barnhill <laughs> the other day because they have lots of divisions and we were setting them up and they were like, oh, well, we'll be interested vendors. I said, I'm wondering what Robert Barnhill, you know, the senior vice president, who is the government's point of contact, is going to think when he's getting all these emails <laughs> for that he's following and he's an interested vendor. Um, one of the other things, and I'll talk about interested vendors, if you do have an account, how many folks have an account in beta.sam? Because I heard grown, so I know you do, right? Um, every time someone, unless they are correcting it, they did not as of yesterday, every time someone signs up as an interested vendor, that point of contact gets an email and tells them there's been an action on your solicitation. The problem is, it doesn't tell you it's interested vendor, so you go in there and you're looking to see if they've put in a mod or, an, I mean, an amendment or they've updated information and really all they've done is somebody's clicked on interested vendor and you're continuing. I have given feedback, so, and I'm sure others have too, so hopefully they'll make a decision because I get hundreds a day of either people logging on as interested vendors or updates because we follow that many opportunities. So just some information if you are and you're getting notices that there's been a change and you click to on the change and you don't see anything, it's probably because somebody signed up as an interested vendor. Um, moving forward, we're going to do a consolidated teaming forum um, as a down select for the hurricane packages to phase two contractors to that group of three or four contractors that are going to be evaluated for award, but also those lists of projects that need to be done um, for MILCON work that we know are coming at Camp Lejeune. We're also going to be supporting, this thing does not like me today. Um, we're going to be supporting for teaming forums for that as well. Some of the contractors that are here today know that if they're recruiting, they can use our web page. We post notice of things that you are uh, pursuing in federal work, and we'll link it right back to you and promote that for you. We'll even host events for you to do recruitment as individuals. We find that, um, and nobody likes Everybody wants their own event, but we find you get the best participation when we bring you in as a group. So for the hurricane packages, we know that that's going to be a viable um, effort on our part. On these larger independent projects, you saw one $122 million at Camp Lejeune. You know, we can establish a recruitment event just for that project for the prime contractor and teams that are going after that work. Um, we're also going to touch on and we'll talk about how important, as Sue said, your capability statement. And I'm really talking about the sub-trades and the small contractors that are looking to partner on these larger works, how important that is. But even any size business, and you're registered in SAM, the government wants to see that information. They want to know who you are, what you can do, you know, maybe even what classifications you are, but most importantly, what are you capable of doing? So a capability statement will communicate that in government language in a very one to two page um, effort. It's very cheap marketing uh, opportunity. So we'll talk about that. We also have um, a presentation that's already on our 
um, website that we'll address back to you when we post the slides for those of you that might need a little more guidance in a capabilities statement. So we're moving on to administrative and logistical requirements. Do we need to stop? Is everybody good? Does anybody have any questions up to this point other than? Because remember, I don't want any whiplash and dying of boredom, okay? Yeah. Um, I was thinking, you know, some folks, we might need to watch you for wheeling around in your chairs. You might need to get a seat belt and back up. As you can tell, I'm an execution side of the house. Sue's area of expertise, even though we both do uh, pre-award and post-award, my, my favorite component is after it's been awarded in the actual construction. Um, Sue's area of expertise is pre-award, source selection, teaming as well. So those are things that um, you know we want to be able to offer up and help you with as we go forward and get to resources. All right, some of the things, again, if you're a federal contractor, you're gonna be aware of these things, depending on the size contracts that you've held in the past. So, insurance, bonding, even licensing. Um, not all contracts require a general contractor to have a general contractor's license, nor do they require you to be a general contractor licensed in that state, but specialty trades and extension of design, electrical, mechanical, those folks you're gonna have to see some licensing for. The larger projects they will require and they will call it out specifically in the RFPs. So that information is given to you. you. Just because you don't have a general contractor's license doesn't mean you can't be a prime contractor. It might mean that you have a smaller area of selected type work you could bid, but that's not necessarily a, a requirement. Insurance and bonding, though, is required. So we're gonna work through insurance and bonding. We're gonna talk about some of, these are some of the hot topics and some of the areas that we've seen that might be um, important as we're trying to execute all this work. Workforce base access, and I'll probably hear some groans from that one too. Um, I think beta.sam has been enough of a headache that they're getting a little break over at the contracting office for the complaints of the access process. Um, we're going to talk about the ever important Davis-Bacon Act, especially when we have contractors that have never done federal work and how important that is. And the prime contractors don't automatically assume they know how to do it and how important that it is. Um, we're going to have a bullet point for teaming agreements, joint ventures as a, part, a potential of a capabilities or as people are pursuing some of the larger work. Um, we actually have specific um, presentations that are already on our website. When we post it, we'll provide that direction to you in the slides. Um, sources of supply, um, Scott, Sue, and I all kind of have a different definition of what that means, so we've just kind of put a bullet point up there and we're gonna to talk to you about that. And we're also gonna talk about all the real important stuff, you know, Everybody's good friends while we're winning work and getting awarded, but what happens when it comes time to pay? And how do those things happen? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today as well. So, again, if you're gonna work on a federal installation, you are going to be required insurance, and depending upon the size of the project, bonding. So the prime contract, um, the prime contractor has to meet the government's minimum, okay? Most general contractors, most contractors more than exceed um, the minimum. But we do have contract work that is are $25,000 and less. So do you need to have a $2 million general liability policy? Well, maybe, maybe not, depending on your your own business model, but even for our first startup contractors that have capabilities of putting in small project work, you know, the minimums are like 500,000, 500, 500, 500. The other thing is, as the prime contractor is always required, the prime contractor is gonna make the determination of what the subcontractor's limits are going to be. And at minimum, those subcontractor's limits need to be what the governments are. It's not a roll down clause because the government is going to hold the prime contractor responsible. And as prime contractor, I'm going to ensure that my subcontractors have insurance. 
Now, when we talk about insurance, general liability, and I'm gonna add a point to this with workman's comp, and I'm gonna add that bullet before we upload. Workman's comp, how many people are small, small companies here from North Carolina that are not required to have workman's comp insurance? Do we have any of those folks in the room? Because there are states that um, the state requirement is if you have three or less employees, your entity is not required to have workman's comp, but it is required if they're gonna do work on a federal base. So workman's comp liability is very important, and I wanna mention when you're talking about 1099, independent contractors, they should have workman's comp or they need to be covered under your rider as a business because somebody's gonna take that responsibility. So, and that also makes them more aware of being an independent contractor and it protects you as a business. And I'm speaking more so for our smaller businesses that utilize a lot of independent contractors to get their, their work performed. Bonding. Bonding is required on all contracts um, and contracts 30,000 or greater require bonding and that's a performance bond. Um, well, they're all required bonding as a performance bond. As you move up, 30 to 150,000 requires a performance bond. Those under 30,000, it is up to the contracting officer to require bonding if that contract value is less than 30,000, but they better list it in the solicitation as a requirement so that those contractors that are bidding it know that it's a requirement. Um, over 150,000 requires performance and payment bonds. That's to the prime contractor. And then the prime contractor is gonna make a determination of what the subcontractor bonding requirements are. Either they'll take a rider or they'll cover that bonding, but we traditionally see on large projects that your major trades, your larger component subcontracts, they will have a bonding requirement from the prime contractor. Workforce base access, okay. So as most of you have known, in the last two years, they have transitioned all services, all Department of Defense services, used to kind of manage their own base access processes. So you would see at one point in time when I was with the Corps of Engineers office at Fort Bragg, they, they managed it, then they went to um, RapidGate and then they decided they wouldn't use RapidGate. And then the Marine Corps base used to do their own, and they went to RapidGate. So now they've become consistent. If you're a DOD um, base, it's the Defense Biometric ID System, DBIDS. Um, for um, Camp Lejeune or MCI East, we've provided the link and some phone numbers. These, these phone numbers, even though they're under MCI East, you can find all the other bases, but this is specific to Camp Lejeune. But you have to be sponsored. You're either going to get a temporary pass or you're going to get badged, okay? If your requirement is going to be longer than 61 days, they will badge you. But so how do you get sponsored? You have to have a contract or you have to have someone that has authorization to sponsor to allow you to come on to the base, either as a visitor or a site visit or an inspection. So it goes through an employee vetting and background check and with the workload that's going to happen, there is a minimum requirement that is set by DBIDS for access and then each base has, gets to set their own determination so right now at Camp Lejeune, if you have employees that have a DWI in their past, they're not going to get on the base. As they execute work, they do have a waiver process, and that information is available at this link. Um, but up to this point, and the folks that I've talked to, there have been very few folks that they have moved beyond, uh, you know, wavering. If they've said no, it was no. But with this amount of work, we think we're going to have to have some creative ability. In the past, at RapidGate, they had tiers. If they had a felony of how many years it was, what type of felony it was. At this point, felony, 
you're not getting on base. We may see that change, we don't know, but you can always follow that link. We also will keep updates available as we can for that. But for your employees to be vetted, um, remember you, a government contract, a reason to be there. They're not just gonna let people on. We get calls all the time, and I know Sue, you probably have, I get it all the time. Can you get me on Camp Lejeune? No, I can't get you on Camp Lejeune. <laughs> what business do you have? What is it that you want to, to do? You have to have a reason and generally it has to be a contract, a contract sponsorship. You have to have the sponsorship information. So generally it'll be in a form of a packet of some sort and your folks are going to have to have appropriate ID documents. So it has to be a valid ID, a passport, a social security card. Sometimes I've even seen them take birth certificates of some of the other IDs aren't allowed, but all that list of information is available for you. You have to have a letter of authorization from your sponsor. It'll say, these are the people that we're authorizing under this letter for this contract number for this amount of time. And then uh, if you're gonna be taking a vehicle on base, those individuals will also have to have their vehicle registration and um, minimum insurance requirements to be able to drive a vehicle on, on base. And again, you're gonna either receive a temporary or a badge, depending on the duration of the time that you're gonna be sponsored to be on there. And currently it's set at 61 days or greater. That may change because especially with the workload that's gonna come down, you're gonna have contractors that may only be on base for 40 or 50 days for one contract, but then they're going on another. So they, they may need to make some decisions and not have to continue to put people time and time again through a vetting if they're working on several contracts. So we're hoping to hear. Um, Joe, have you heard any new information in regards to base access? Across the board, the Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune is looking at how we bring aboard um, contractors and vendors aboard the base. Uh, we recognize that people who aren't wearing a uniform, who aren't United States Marines or, or U.S. sailors, or need to come aboard the base to execute this work. And you're real people. You're not characters in a Hallmark movie. You have past, you, you have history. And so we, we acknowledge and we, we're certainly aware of that. We're looking at physical changes. We're looking at policy changes, infrastructure changes more points of access and where we can do, do all those things. Things that will expand and make it easier to base access. But the other piece of that, we all got a very sobering reminder of at the beginning of this month. The shooting out of Pearl Harbor, the shootings in Pensacola. These are real, persistent, enduring threats that we think about on a daily basis. And so we, we have that need to understand who's coming aboard our facility and why they're there. And so security will remain our number one priority. Even as we work to, to accommodate you, to bring you on board the base, we're gonna maintain our, secu our high security posture so that we're not the next installation to hit the headlines and there's not a shooting that's occurring locally. Great. One of the things, you know, we're, we are encouraging um, higher military, higher military, separating military, retired military. Um, one of the things are, just because you have a military ID access to a base, does not mean that you're authorized to work as a contractor on the base. So if you have military personnel that are working on the base, using their military badges to go in and they're on a project and they're not listed on the access roster, they can be removed from your project. So the requirement is that you have to be vetted through the badging office as a contractor. Um, I've experienced that personally because I go to a lot of site visits. I have a military ID. I occasionally um, make the decision last moment that I'm gonna go to a site visit. And I was told very quickly one day that um, when I was with a group of folks that were going through badging and they're like, do you need a badge? I'm like, no, I have my military ID. Are you going with these folks? Yes, you cannot go unless you're vetted as a contractor to go to the site visit. So I said I was going to the commissary. So I did get on base that day, I did make it, but from here on out, I do register. Okay? Of course. Of course. 
And actually, I did go to the commissary. I was on base. Why wouldn't you not go to the commissary while you were there? I have three big kids. You, they eat a lot. Okay, so some of the other things. Again, if you're a federal contractor, you know these. If you've operated on federal contracts or if you've operated on state-funded contracts, you understand some of these things that are required. Very important, and they are cracking down on it, as well as a lot of service contracts now have reporting in SAM for the prime contractor. Um, so this information is very important. The Davis-Bacon Act um, applies to construction. That talks about the wages for the classification of the labor of your trades folks that are working on base. The, the labor classification and wage de determination should be enlisted in the solicitations when you're bidding work. You need to look to see that you're paying your folks. You don't want to see that you um, misprice something by $10 an hour plus $4.87 in fringe. Uh, because you didn't look to check to see what your your labor classification would be. Um, it's in the solicitation and then again incorporated into the contract. You can also find them in beta.sam. They will be attached to the, um, the solicitations now. That's one of the integrations that they're doing. But you can also find or you can go to the area that the work's being done to the Department of Labor's website for those wage determinations. Weekly payment of trades, and I'll have companies go, well, we only pay two weeks. I'm like, if they're a subcontractor, I mean, if they're a sub-trade laborer, a mechanic or a laborer, they have to get paid weekly. And the way that we know that they're getting paid weekly is that certified payrolls are submitted, and there is a form that can be used um, to submit and it can be handwritten in as long as it's certified by the person that's responsible for paying those individuals. And that's not, the prime contractor does not do certified payroll for the subcontractor. The subcontractor has to do their own. And if you have independent contractors, 1099, they have to fill out their own. So you can hand, the minimum requirement is using the information required on the WH-347, and we've provided a link for that. They have to be reported weekly for a prior pay period. So at any point in time, you should never be behind more than two weeks um, in certified payroll being submitted as your contract requires or uploaded in any of the processes that are required, and that'll be identified in your contract. Team agreements and joint ventures. We actually have a presentation that will provide the direction to you for that. Some of this work is large. As a contractor, you may want to combine your resources with other folks under teaming agreements or joint ventures. If you're going to pursue as a uh, prime contractor, they have to be, they don't have to be formal, which means that you have to create a separate entity, but they have to be formal in writing. It has to be defined. Um, so we'll point you guys back to that information as well. Sources of supply. Scott, I'm going to let you give your definition of sources of supply real quick. Yeah, just a couple of comments on this. You know, if you're, if you're a supplier and you're the only supplier of roofing shingles in this area, don't assume this is an automatic deal for you, okay? We've seen when the big wave of construction came through, Eight, nine years ago, we saw people establish batch plants on the base to provide materials for this work. So be very aggressive if you're a supplier in working with subcontractors and general contractors about being the source of supply for your materials. Sue, you want to talk about your? Sue says no. Yeah. The, the other thing I talk about, sources of supply, one of the, the areas that we had concern when NAFAC came to us was they knew we were going to have a labor deficit. It was a concern, right? Um, but they didn't feel like we were going to have a material deficit. Well, we're still in recovery here in North Carolina. I've watched my neighbor for two years with her roof still tarp, and the roofers just showed up yesterday. So is it labor? Some of it was material. Material. And think about we're talking about large contracts and some of the requirements from the Buy American Act that are going to affect the sources of supply for these projects, especially in new out-of-the-ground construction. 
So the real important one, let's talk about getting paid a little bit. All right, so as a prime contractor, they have privity to the government. They bill the government. The government pays them. Um, sometimes where we see a little disconnect is what are the requirements of me getting paid, especially if you're a small contractor. Um, I will tell you that a billing cycle generally is not very quick with the government at times. You do get paid. It, you need to be prepared for at least 45 days, sometimes 60 days for the first payment as a prime contractor. And then... Go back um, on. Sorry. I know, I don't know why it keeps jumping the gun here. It's ready to go, is it 1.30 almost, that's why. Um, so, but as a subcontractor, you know, what does that mean to me? How am I gonna get paid? When am I gonna get paid? A lot of that is negotiations and what your payment terms are with your prime contractor, your sources of suppliers, and those ideas. But there's also requirements of when the prime contractor has to pay you. So. The Miller Act, as you see, is listed here that says projects in excess of 150,000, um, they can bring civil against the prime contractor's bond. And if you're a subcontractor, before you sign your subcontract, request the prime contractor's bond. And if you aren't being paid in a timely fashion and there are four tiers, that information will be provided in a link to direct back for more information for you for you to be able to obtain payment, okay? As well as your tier. And as we're talking about teaming, even in these large, large packages, you may be close to the food chain, but you, if you're third tier down, you start losing this remedy at all. As a, as a subcontractor, um, the sub of a sub of a sub, Miller Act may not apply to you. So those are the things, but again, We'll have that, that link available for you to go back to if you have any questions about that. In 88, a long time later, it took us 50 years to get to this one, the Prompt Payment Act occurred. Small businesses sitting in here goes, okay, you've already said it's gonna take the prime contractor time to get his initial payment. After those, they should be, depending on their progress billing, within 30 to 45 days, they should be receiving payment when they bill. When am I gonna get billed? What does it say? Within seven days. So the prime contractor has seven days to pay you unless they have some dispute in regards to your invoicing, okay? And just think about that. If you're the sub of a sub, you're gonna add another seven days because it rolls down in seven days. So a third or a fourth tiered sub could be 60 days, you know, 75 days out from the time that the prime contractor got paid by law before there's a remedy. Um, but that's the requirement. The Small Business Act, to encourage all you prime contractors, um, yes, it is you're in control of your subcontractors and if you have legitimate reasons that you reduce their payment, you have an obligation to report that back to the government. Okay, resources. We're gonna breeze through these pretty quick because we've talked about there's lots of resources in North Carolina to support you. Federal, state, local, and even private sector resources to support you in your bid to grow your business in federal contracting and to pursue this work. So um, Active Links, the Small Business Administration, they do a great job. Um, NAFACT Midland has a small business office. Um, I think as federal government, we just automatically assume large business. If you've made it to large business, you don't need as many resources. Um, 
And then, of course, MCIE Small Business Office. I'm going to make sure to give you Joe's home number and cell phone number again. Um, so for the state of North Carolina, the Small Business Administration Office is located in Charlotte. Great resources. That will be their link to directly to their page, so you don't have to hunt them down on the SBA's big page. Um, the Small Business Technical Development Center, there's one in every state, uh, generally located within a university system. Um, this link will take you to the North Carolina SBTDC. Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or the PTAC, as you see I didn't finish taking that off there. Um, that link will take you to the North Carolina PTACs and they're located around the state as well. Great resources for small business and large business. And of course, we think we're the best. The North Carolina Military <coughs> Business Center. We, we find that these folks are great and I think one of our slides is not showing, but the small business centers for business support in the community college, just like ours here at Coastal Carolina Community College are great resources as well. But for federal contracting, these are your specific requirements. And then when we get to the NCNBC, um, again, myself and Sue were the construction specialists um, for the industry. Uh, we have gave you the link to the uh, Max and the May talks, the current prime contracts as they occur, we upload them. We're trying to update because we've got a lot that are expiring right now. And then, of course, we have the invitations to bid page from those contractors that are pursuing subcontractors and vendors. Um, that page is available for you as well. We should have this posted tomorrow for you folks. Um, some of the things that we're going to be doing is training for contractors, large business and small business. Uh, certified payroll, your, your folks don't know how to fill it out. We're, we can do some training. WAWF, you don't know how to build your contract. We can help provide some support and training for that as well. Um, lots of, of type training opportunities. You need some training on how to do a capability statement. We can help you there too. We're going to do um, the consolidated team informs. Dates are to be t determined as phase two packages go down and this other MILCON work that's going to occur. So monitor our page, you probably get blasted anyway, so you'll be getting that information. Uh, additional uh, teaming forms as requested by primes, they have either won awards or pursuing work, and they can be supported right here at Coastal Carolina Community College or in other areas within the state of North Carolina. Um, we're going to, I know we're at our time, these slides will be made available for you again. Uh, Scott, we love this slide so much, we put it in there twice. <laughs> well, um, it, it, let me mention, because we had a question on the solicitation. So uh, this is the proposed acquisition schedule. Superimposed on that, the red lines are when we anticipate doing these consolidated teaming forums. So correct me if I'm wrong, packages one, two, and four, they came out in October. They were due November the 8th. Uh, packages three and seven came out in November and were due, phase one proposals were due December 17th. All, of, all five of those you can get on beta.sam.gov and I believe we have them on our hurricane recovery page as well. So you can see the actual solicitation. Packages five and six have not been announced yet. I think we're anticipating package five on December 23rd, I think is some intel that we got. The, the actual uh, uh, phase one uh, submission to be announced and six has not been announced yet. I uh, believe that's right. So, so uh, five of them have already been announced. You'll see those links. The other two we're still waiting on. Uh, and you can see the timing on the, on the, uh, on the forums. Next. So the solicitation numbers for the ones that have been released are on, they'll take you directly to that. The ones that have not, those solicitation numbers have not been determined and released at this time yet, but monitor our page for the hurricane recovery page. And as soon as it's posted, it'll, that link will become active on our page and you'll have direct access back to beta.sam. Yes.
Yes. Yes, I believe everybody signed a, a consent for that. I'll have to double check. We may redact some information on there, but we should be able to do that for you. Yeah, we always post attendee list when you sign up. It said if you have an objection, let us know, but we will post the attendee list. Next. All right, so that's what our web page looks like, as you can see. You want we me to cover? Have, yep. Okay, so if you go to our home page, there's two things that are very important. If you go under industries, you'll see our construction and infrastructure page. That talks about all the existing MAX, MATOX, and then there's a special area for the hurricane recovery. So for all the information from this briefing, you'll see on that point. This is the construction and infrastructure page. These arrows point to some important information. We have spreadsheets that show the existing MAC contractors, the current ongoing contracts, who the prime contractors are, uh, and also uh, a link back to the FedCon. We're not supposed to call it that. Summit slides from October. There's a lot of information about the MILCON programs that are going on in North Carolina. And all of our past events that had presentations, if you'll go to past events and find that, our presentations are located for those for, for a number of years. And this is the hurricane response page you come to if you click on it from the home page. And all the information about each one of the packages is included here. Right. So, and again, when five and six are announced, they will become active on our page as well. Okay. Okay. Um, this is the invitation to bid page that she mentioned that you'll go to from the uh, from the hurricane recovery page. So you'll see these are contractors. This was a, we actually probably have a few more on there. Um, when they have an event that they want to announce, we post, we post it here and we promote it with the link back to this opportunity that has your information associated. Matchforce, if you're not familiar with Matchforce, you're a North Carolina company, register on Matchforce, you will get prime contract opportunities delivered to you automatically. If you love searching beta.sam.gov, first of all, we probably need to have you checked out, but secondly, if not, Register on Match Force, they'll come to you automatically. It's worth its weight in gold, especially now. Next slide. Um, that's the same thing. That's about Match Force. Again, our wedge page, upcoming events, hurricane recovery on our homepage. You don't even have to find us, but spend some time going through the tabs. Lots of great information and presentations for you. So, again, uh, to be determined. Uh, recovery support events and training, and the hurricane package phase two and large MILCON other single acquisition construction opportunities um, will be announced there as well. These are our regular events, got to plug those for 2020 coming up starting in April, and then of course our favorite is October 21st and 22nd in uh, Wilmington again this year. Um, is the Southeastern Region Federal Construction Infrastructure Environmental Summit. Boy, that's a mouthful. And then local areas, City of Jacksonville, and the links will become active there. Um, Onslow County, Jacksonville, Onslow Economic Development, those links will become active on, you'll see the links when this is posted. Private sector, don't ever just, you know, not choose to um, use some of these organizations. The Chamber of Commerce, especially here in Jacksonville, they're a great resource. Um, the Carolinas AGC, we do a lot of um, information share and promotion, um, as well as ABC Carolinas, same thing. And Defense Alliance in North Carolina, those are just a few. Whether you're a North Carolina company or not a North Carolina company, these folks are great resources, so we want you to choose to uh, consider reaching out to them. Okay, Questions? so let me, let me comment on just a couple of things, timeline. There's a lot of slides there, and if you think back to the slide with the red arrows on it. All right, so the first three packages came out in October. Phase one proposals were due in November. The announcement of, of who is downlisted to, to phase two should happen in December or early January. We haven't seen it yet. So those first three packages, we should have a phase two decision on what three prime contractors are selected either later this month or early in January. So if you're interested in those three packages, what's gonna happen is hopefully we will know who those three down selected prime contractors are. 
We'll go out to all three and we're going to propose a consolidated teaming forum. What does that mean? So if company A, B, and C are all down selected, we'll reach out to them and say, look, you have been down selected here in early January. Your proposal is going to be due in April. Somewhere between January and March, we'll announce to you a consolidated teaming forum. We'll bring in all three primes. They'll pitch their company and their process and how you get certified as a sub, and you'll have a chance to meet with them individually. That's for those three packages. The next two packages just were are, uh, due yesterday, the phase one. So you'll get a phase two down select decision in January or early February. So again, for those two packages, watch for a teaming forum somewhere between February and April, okay? And the final two packages, which we haven't even seen the phase one documents for yet, they won't be down selected probably until at least February. So watch for a teaming forum for those between March and June. So we're being very aggressive about monitoring these opportunities. You're welcome to do so as well. I really recommend the hurricane recovery page for the latest information about the status of each one of these packages, okay? Uh, so, because that's going to progress starting in January, we're going to see the down select to phase two, the proposals come out for those phase two companies, their response about 60 to 90 days later, in the middle in there is the teaming events, okay? With awards being made between July and September, all right? We also do a, a um, consolidated teaming forum. We have the Big Mac that is going to be the large construction, almost a, mil a billion dollars worth of work is going to be executed through that over the next five years. We'll be doing a consolidated teaming forum for those individuals once that selection occurs, um, as well as the other construction MAC holders that are with NAFACT. And so we try to do that to give you the opportunity to get in front of as many people. And it's also very good for their marketing because we can bring a lot more people together in uh, one event rather than individual. All right. I just really encourage when you see the announcement of those teaming forums to come to those and come prepared with the capability statement. And if you need uh, some help with that, we can help you. Anything else? Yep. Wrap any, it up. Any questions? Thank you for coming. How are you?